Coming up next on Tech News Weekly, it's me, Jason Howell, and my co-host, Micah Sargent. We talk with Jeff John Roberts from Decrypt about what's behind the big crypto meltdown that just happened. Also, we have Rene Ritchie, a double dose of Rene Ritchie. He's got a bunch of reviews to talk about. And Google I.O. We talk about the good and, unfortunately, the not so good. All that coming up on Tech News Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 184, recorded Thursday, May 20th, 2021. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Hover. Whether you're a developer, photographer, or small business, Hover has something for you to expand your projects and get the visibility you want. Go to hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. And by Manscaped, the best in men's below-the-belt grooming. Smooth it out, fellas, with Manscaped. Get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com slash twit. And by Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment. Delve into your next title on Audible with Audible Plus. New members can try Audible Plus for 30 days. Download the Audible app and get started with a free trial at audible.com slash TNW or text TNW to 500-500. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I'm the other guy, Jason Howell. Micah, it's good to have you back. Thank you. I am glad to be here and uh, glad to be vaccinated and, and all yeah. that jazz. All very good. As Leo's been calling it all week, the sequel injection, which I'm amazed that we haven't heard that term prior yeah. to the last week. It's it's kind of perfect in the technology world. <laughs> it is. Uh, well, it's good to have you back. And uh, this top story, this has been interesting. So I've been, I found myself uh, more and more interested in the comings and the goings of the cryptocurrency uh, world in the past many months. And yesterday was a very big day, I would say. Uh, definitely a day that many crypto investors were bracing for, or at least maybe fearing, depends on who you asked. Across the board, the crypto market tumbled. Pretty dramatic fall from pretty incredible heights prior. It was kind of a bull market, it really took off. I think late last year, it started to really catch some steam. Uh, Bitcoin reached its highest point of nearly $65,000. And then yesterday, things kind of came back down to earth um, in a grand way. So joining us to talk about yesterday's big sell-off and what it means going forward is Jeff John Roberts, who's the executive editor at Decrypt. Welcome back to the show, Jeff. Hey, Jason, great to be here. Just the outset, I gotta say props to the my sequel pun. I haven't heard that, but that's brilliant. So. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. I know. The second we heard it, we were like, whoa, wait a minute. Where has that been for the last year? Uh, yeah, totally agree. So um let's let's start off a little bit with, you know, you you wrote about all of the many forces that are pointing uh at this kind of uh, crypto market correction that happened starting yesterday anyways, a $500 billion evaporation of the market. Um, and that's that's no small number. Uh, I think everybody's you know heard the comments by Elon Musk and the moves by Tesla regarding Bitcoin. So it's easy to point fingers at Elon. Uh, at least you know he he could be the easy like uh, person to blame, but you actually write that there's a whole lot of other elements at play here. Kind of start by explaining what you mean by all that. Yeah, I mean I think when like there's a major market crash, people like to say, oh, it's because of this, you know. But right. it, it's not usually that, and that's the case here as well. Um, what was going on is, I mean, asset prices were just inflated. Call it a, a bubble if you want, call it something else. But it was just kind of overdue for a correction of some sort. So there will be like a sort of triggering factor. But, you know, it's not just one thing that explains it. It's kind of like World War One. I. I realize this is an old geeky history, but France, Duke, Ferdinand, or whatever his name, got shot and everyone started fighting. You know, but there, there was a lot more going on. That's what happened here. Um, you know, Elon Musk didn't help. Uh, rumors out of China didn't help. 
But, you know, it was basically, you know, the, the market was waiting for this. And when it happened, a bunch of cascading factors, you know, kicked into place, including a sell off by a bunch, of, a bunch of people who were, you know, leveraged. And that's then you got yesterday, Bitcoin falling to nearly 30,000, you know, from, you know, sort of 45,000. Uh, and that's sort of what's going on. You know, you can pile on other factors where some people say it's tax day. A lot of people made a lot of money in crypto last year. Uh, they had to file with the IRS, you know, and pay Uncle Sam. That didn't help. So it's just this sort of interlocking series of factors that sort of sparked this panic. And then it becomes a general panic. And then people just start selling because everyone else is selling. So, you know, I mean, Elon Musk, I think, kind of helped kick off the fun. But uh, a lot of other stuff is going on, too. Yeah, Elon Elon's comments definitely seemed to uh, set uh, to kind of change the mindset. Prior to that, it really seemed like everybody, you know, as I've been following it, anyways, everybody was just incredibly positive about yes, everything's going to go through the roof and it's going to continue and there is no end in sight. Once Elon started kind of opening his mouth uh, about about a lot of this stuff, it really changed the tenor of things. Whether one person should have that kind of influence over this sort of thing or not is a whole different story. But nonetheless, that's, you know, that's at least what kind of seemed to shift the conversation a little bit. You mentioned China um, and, and you wrote about China, of course. What 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 were the, you know, the, the different people who were writing about uh, China's involvement you know, with pulling back from crypto or reporting it? Are, are they reporting it incorrectly? Like what's the what's the misconception there uh, as far as China's involvement with crypto and the changes uh, very recently? Yeah, I don't want to take a shot at another news outlet, and it's one I used to work at Reuters, but Reuters has a penchant for reporters getting rewarded for choice. It's exclusive. And so, you know, they came out with this screaming headline of China bans cryptocurrency, and they walked it back a bit. Um, you know, what's really going on in 2017 that, you know, Communist Party of China said financial, you know, institutions do not get involved, do not touch this stuff. That was from 2017. And what happened, I think, on Monday was, um, you know, I think the Chinese Central Bank and someone else in China reiter reiterated that this is the policy. So it was kind of like non-news news, news, but the market was so skittish and waiting for something like this that the Reuters thing set off a bunch of panic social media tweets. China bans cryptocurrency. No, they didn't. You know, they just sort of cautioned financial institutions from using it. Um, you know, so but that, you know, fed into the general skittishness that Musk had drummed up over the weekend and set off a new cycle of, kind of panic selling. And as you said, the narrative shifts, you know, with the markets, it's often a narrative. Everything's great. This is going up. And then when it goes the other way, suddenly everything's bad and it confirms all your worst fears. <laughs> so, you know, it's just this sort of hysteria out there. But, you know, if you've been around crypto for a long time, you've seen it before. And it's just been a long time since we've had like a good old fashioned Bitcoin crash. And now the stakes are a lot higher because the price is a lot higher. A lot more people are playing. So, yeah, yeah. Not only are the prices higher, but there's a lot more retail investors. A lot, I, I would say, in the last six months, let's say, when things have just been screaming, and especially with you know meme coins, which we can talk about. But it really seems like there's a lot of people who are entering into the market that maybe you know had written crypto uh, currency and trading in crypto off for years, and then suddenly they're like, "Well, wait a minute. I I, I understand a little bit more about how you can actually make money here uh, to the moon," and then. And then something like this happens, it's a lot of those people, it's their first time experiencing any sort of correction. For them, it's just been up and now not so much. <laughs> Totally. And I think the fact that you said to the moon, which is kind of like an insider crypto thing or used to be, um, yeah. you know, but now it's kind of gone mainstream. You know, the fact sure. sort of a mainstream tech site like yours is using that phrase, which once upon a time would only be kind of a limited number of Bitcoin geeks. But you're, you're totally right. And so all of these voices amplify the hype cycle on the way up and the panic on the way down. So, you know, it's I think important to kind of step back and look at, you know, that this is you know, cyclical. And you saw that Bitcoin kind of, you know, corrected itself and came back above 40,000 today. And then the IRS came out with some scary news and went back down, but not to the same degree. It's just, I think, the function of kind of like asset bubbles and manias, you're going to see this stuff. And, you know, it used to be a regular feature of the crypto cycle. It's just been a while since we've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you mentioned the IRS news. Um, are you are you referring to the the Biden news that uh, something about that? I think I just saw this right before showtime. Ten thousand uh, dollar transfers might have have a requirement of being reporting. Is that what you're talking about? What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I mean, that's not good in a sense. I mean, I think Crypto Defenders saying, like, what the heck, you know, this, why are you sort of singling out these assets? But it is going to cause, um, you know, problems and, and fear in the markets. It seems a bit of overdoing by the IRS. But, you know, the bigger picture, the U.S. Treasury is like on the warpath for money. And in the past, they went after Swiss bank accounts. And this year's sort of asset they're hunting is crypto. And that just means they're kind of turning up the dial a lot. And the reality is there is a lot of people who use crypto to evade taxes. So, you know, I think it's bad news for them. But, you know, for ordinary people, it shouldn't be. Well, and, and continually the, the, the uh, you know, often the sphere or the view of crypto is seen through this very kind of like uh, – uh, what what's the word that I'm looking for? Looking at crypto as a way to get around, you know, a lot of other things. It could be getting around taxes. Or it could be making money fast or whatever. Like one thing that I'm reminded of is that you know I'm, I've read at least a little bit of this like general uh, consensus or conspiracy around this idea that institutional investors are actually manipulating the market uh, so that you know to kind of bleed the retail investors from the money that they've put in so that they can get a, a larger claim and everything. There's there's just a lot of like um, of kind of uh, well you mentioned the word hysteria hysteria around crypto because of what is uncertain and that only feeds into it is there any legitimacy to claims such as as those I guess maybe it's impossible to know for certain but what are, what are your thoughts there yeah no I think you're not wrong I think with mainstream cryptos like Bitcoin and Ethereum they're you know they're less vulnerable to being kind of manipulated or in the industry to talk about whales, you know, there's sort of people who hold like, you know, millions of this stuff and they might cooperate with each other in secret telegram chats to talk it up. And then, you know, kind of spurks, you know, you know, on Twitter, use social media to spur into, you know, interest in it. And then when it goes up, the bag holders dump what they, what they have and fleece retail people. This has been part of crypto since the beginning. And unfortunately it's still going on, but as things like Bitcoin and Ethereum become mainstream, it's harder to do that. So they move to altcoins and you see these, you know, you know, sort of charlatans on social media saying laser eyes to the moon, blah, blah, blah. And they get other people with large social media followers. And it's not, you know, it's, it, it's not a good thing. And, you know, it just, I think underscores, you really should know what you're doing before you go into this, you know, get familiar with Bitcoin and Ethereum. And, you know, if you want to pile into Doge, well, be my guest, but it just seems like a bad idea. Um, you know, and especially the, you know, the sort of offshoots, there was a thing last week called like SHIB based on Shiba Inu coin. And that was one of the most sort of like disgraceful, you know, social media pumps I've seen. But, you know, part of it's buyer beware. I mean, what do you expect is going to happen? I don't want to sound insensitive, but as I know some people, you know, a friend gives them a tip and it goes up and this sounds great and they lose a bunch of money. But, you know, it's, <laughs> it's you know, as I keep saying, buyer beware out there. Yeah. I mean, you know, all it takes is, is one article. I think I saw an article last week about uh, two uh, two brothers or something that invested early in, in Shiba Inu and, you know, suddenly they're up 10 million. And all it takes is one of those stories to go any sort of mainstream. And suddenly you have a bunch of new people, uh, new investors, um, you know, thinking, oh, well, I want to do that too. And, you know, that that only has bad outcomes, <laughs> in my opinion. I think a lot of people share that opinion. Um, so no question that this rise and meme coin uh, action, Doge, Shiba, there's a whole bunch of them there, um, could have been, I, I think a lot of people pointed to those, have been pointing to those anyways, and saying, ah, this gives me a bad feeling that, you know, this tells me that there is some sort of a shift upcoming. Do you think that, that was part of what we're seeing here as well? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's sort of been, you know, like this can't last feeling going on for right. a while. And I the chickens came home to roost. But, you know, I also want to underscore that, you know, I don't like this stuff because it sort of tarnishes the crypto industry more broadly. There's a lot of really valuable and important projects being built out there and really cool technology, you know, that's remaking sort of like, you know, the idea of building Web3 and the movement to decentralized foundation is a great goal. A lot of the financial innovation is wonderful. But then you sort of get these, you know, sort of more on crypto bros coming in you know, doing pump and dumps right and left. And it makes everyone else look shady, which I think is a shame. I mean, I was a mainstream tech journalist for years. I went into crypto in part because I believe in the technology, but, you know, sort of stuff like this just really, you know, makes everyone look bad. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Um, well, Jeff, it's a pleasure getting you on and, uh, I, I love having the opportunity to, um, get a little bit more, uh, attention, at least on the twit network. Cause I feel like sometimes, 
uh, kind of what's going on in the crypto space doesn't get a whole lot of attention on the network, partially for exactly what you were just talking about because of, you know, just kind of this sense that there's a lot of shadiness going on or, or whatever. But I do think that it's important from a technological standpoint. There's a lot of, of incredible innovation going on. I personally don't feel like it's a flash in the pan uh, that, you know, something that's just going to fizzle and die. It might not be what all of the, you know, to the, the the people who are looking to make a bunch of money off of it, it might not be exactly what they think it's going to be, but I do think that there's some incredible technology there and that's going to power a lot of what we do on the internet in the future. So I really appreciate your time and I'll be um, definitely following the work that you're doing and uh, reach out and invite you back because I think this is important stuff to, to cover on the show. Uh, Jeff, if people want to follow you online, obviously it's decrypt.co is who you write for. If they want to find you, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Jeff John Roberts. Please check out Decrypts because what we're trying to do is reduce sort of a, the verge or wired for cryptocurrency because there's so much cool stuff going on and we're trying to kind of put more signal through the noise. And uh, Jason, always a pleasure. You're a real pro at this and it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to sort of share some of these ideas um, with with your listeners. And, you know, you've always been so sort of mature and responsible and presenting people, you know, with, you know, what they need to know in a really straightforward way. So thanks very much for having me on. Oh, I really appreciate that, Jeff. Thank you so much. Uh, it's our pleasure. And we'll talk to you soon. Take care of yourself. Take care. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, up next, a few new Apple products will be available starting tomorrow. And Renee Ritchie joins us to talk about his reviews and some news. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by my hero and, well, my downfall. It is Hover. And I say my downfall because I get so many Hover domains just all the time because it's so simple to buy Hover domains. They make it so simple. So I immediately want to go and get them. Uh, it's time for you out there to make plans and let Hover help you achieve them. If you're a blogger, if you're creating a portfolio, if you're building an online store, or you just want to make a more memorable redirect to your LinkedIn page, Hover has the best domain names and email addresses just for you. Email at your domain name is key to connecting with customers and building trust for your brand. They have domain-based emails for all your needs, small or large, and it's super easy to set up. You can add as many mailboxes to your domain as you need, and when your domain renews, your mailboxes will too. The prices are unbeatable. Their most popular mailbox is a no-brainer solution for business owners. And you can get access from anywhere. You can use the email app you're already comfortable with, or if apps aren't really your thing, then you can just use their webmail so that you can access it wherever you are. I am a hover fanatic. I use Hover uh, anytime it comes time to register a domain name or anytime I'm uh, doing a show and something ridiculous comes up and I'm like, you know what, that'd be a good domain name. It's kind of like the um, the band name of of, of today. You, you come up with a good band name and you're like, yeah, one day I'll start a band. Me, it's like one day I'll start a website. So I just hop on over to Hover, type it in, and within seconds I can see uh, the, the domain that I'm looking for or if not the domain I'm looking for, then lots of great suggestions. So actually, John, let's do a little uh, test here. Um, let's go um, uh, chicken lover shop. Chicken lover shop. And let's see what uh, Hover <laughs> recommends for chicken lover shop. You're really so narrowing you in on the Petaluma market here. Yeah, exactly. Chickenloversshop.com is available, but also chickenlover.shop is available. Ah, you can also you get... Go. They, isn't that great? Uh, then there are some some other ones like chickenloversshop.art, chickenloversshop.me, which of course would be the one that I would get, or chickenloversshop.io. They have so many options. Many of them are on sale. Yeah, there's one for 699.biz. And you add them to your cart. You can move along in the process very easily. And what I love, uh, Hover supports Apple Pay. So it's very quick for me. I just put my fingerprint down on my Mac or if I'm doing it from my phone or something like that, then scan my face and bada bing, bada boom, I've got a new domain name. Um, Hover also, one of the things I love about it is that it's not there to upsell you on stuff you don't need. They just want to help. So they've got pro-level tools, including powerful domain and email management tools that are intuitive and easy to use, whether you're a web pro or you're just getting started. Uh, it's private and secure. Uh, something you should know is that 
if you go and register a domain, you don't use who is privacy, where some sites will actually charge you extra for who is privacy. Uh, Hover does not do that. Then they can find your info. Anybody can find your information connected to your domain online. But with that privacy protection in place, they're not able to find your information. It's all protected and private, as you would suggest. And so Hover is not upselling you on that. Your private information will remain private. And it's a great way to reduce spam and protect yourself from unwanted solicitations. And Hover Connect, by the way, is this great way to pick the service you want to use to build and host your website. So instead of having to go through a long process to get your uh, domain that you just purchased set up with a, a specific service that you want out there, Connect helps you do it with just some easy uh, sort of step-by-step -step options. And sometimes it's just a couple of clicks. Uh, at Hover, you're a customer and not a source of data. So take back control of your data with reliable, tracker-free email, unlike the uh, folks we many of us use for our email. Hover is trusted by hundreds of thousands of customers who use their domain names and email to turn their ideas into reality, myself included. Whether you're a developer, a photographer, or a small business, Hover has something for you to expand your projects and get the visibility you want. Go to hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. That's hover.com slash twit for 10% off your domain extension for a full year. And of course, we thank Hover for their support of this show and of course, of Twit as well. All right, folks, as I mentioned, tomorrow, uh, as it is today, Thursday, tomorrow, Friday, there will be several new or a few rather uh, new products available. Uh, for for purchase. And some of us, you know, did pre-orders of those. And um, I wanted to talk about those new products and get some, some sort of first looks, first thoughts on them. And so joining us today is Renee Ritchie of youtube.com slash Renee Ritchie uh, to tell us about his reviews of some of these products, starting with the iMac and the iPad Pro. Welcome back to the show, Renee. Always oh, so great to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Micah. Of course. So as we can see in the background there, you've got a nice purpley iMac. Uh, this is this is one of the new iMacs that uh, Apple has has announced and released, and in, in the many colors that are available. Um, so let's talk about this machine because we've seen uh, seen some different reviews, some different thoughts on it. This is Apple's. M1 iMac. So it's uh, we're, we're going away from Intel. We're moving to M1. And what is it that uh, M1 provides? What is it that makes uh, the, this design and M1 kind of combine uh, to make something, to make it new, to make it different from the iMacs of years past? The ye old iMacs of yore, so to speak. <laughs> um, there's a few things that are really interesting about this. When Apple started making their custom silicon, they were doing it for mobile devices, for things like iPhones and iPads. And those have, they have really high power efficiency needs. They are very small, which means they have very low thermal envelopes. You can't get too hot. You can't be too power hungry. Like an iPhone draws about five, six watts uh, of power. And that's compared to what we're used to with Intel processors, maybe like 60 watts or more. So they had to be very, very conservative. And they discovered over time that the more efficient you get, the faster that you can go, the more performance comes with it. So when they spun those chips out, when they started making them bigger for originally the iPhone, the iPad Pros, started adding more cores to them, they found it really scaled nicely. And so with M1, they're bringing it to the Mac, and we'll get to them bringing it back to the iPad in a second. But instead of it giving really long battery life, like we saw with the M1 MacBook Air and M1 MacBook Pro, you get 15, 17 hours of battery life because the chips were so low power and so efficient. And the iMac doesn't have a battery. So a lot of people are like, why, why, why even do this? But it gives you the same sort of thermal profile. So instead of just getting a lot of power efficiency on battery life, you're getting it in terms of you don't need a giant casing with a big bubble aluminum back on it anymore just to house the heat of the processor and the fans that go with it you can now make these slim sleek ipad like enclosures so let them totally re-envision how they could design the machine because they didn't have to account again for like 60 plus watts of of just uh chipset power anymore Nice, nice. It's so uh, slim. I've seen some people just kind of picking it up and hefting it around because of of how slim it is and uh, the display. Pounds. That's how much under ten pounds. You could do your fitness plus curls with it, Micah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh man, that's that's a really nice. And um, one of the new things is is uh, the power connector on the back. Apple um, put the Ethernet jack into the power adapter so that it can kind of all be out of the way. So you've just got the one plug that goes into the back of the screen, and then you've got um, it's Thunderbolt and USB C, right? Yeah, well, this the power brick has an Ethernet on the back, and what I'm guessing is they're transiting USB over the the power cable because it's got this weird three prong power cable, and of course, because Apple is Apple, you also have this. Oh, I'll pull it up. This color matched Doctor wow. Octopus tentacle magnetic connector on the back, which just kind of looks at you, but it, it just thwacks right into the back, <laughs> uh, and then. Because they made M1 for Mac, the iPad traditionally didn't have any PCIe lanes. It didn't have any Thunderbolt drivers, but they put two Thunderbolt controllers right on the board for M1. Uh, and so you have two of those. You have two USB. It's so confusing because USB numbers are basically like the generation of speed and USB letters are the type of connector. So it's still <laughs> right. a USB-C shaped connector but now it's usb 4 which means that not only does it have like the previous usb 3.x speeds but it also integrates in thunderbolt 3 speeds so you're getting 40 megabits per second now on two of them if you pony up an extra couple hundred bucks you can get an additional two usb c usb 3 ports which aren't as fast because there's only two <laughs> thunderbolt controllers but if you want an addition it's a usb is a standard and every standard just has to be confusing it drives me nuts yeah it is. It, it's actually it's standard for them to be for standards to be confusing. confusing. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. um, so then let's talk about some of the the other features. Um, did it come with the color matched keyboard that has the the built in touch ID on it? Yeah, it does. I didn't put it close enough to grab, but yeah. Uh, so you have an option for the low cost version for the twelve ninety nine version. It's just a standard, um, you know, Apple Magic keyboard with ni new, newly rounded corners and color matched to whatever iMac color you get. But again, for the for the fourteen ninety nine and up model, you get Touch ID, and it's clever because uh, you don't want to just transmit a signal. Like you don't want to just put someone's fingerprint and then transmit it over the air. So they have a secure block on the keyboard that actually handles the Touch ID, and then it'll authenticates that token, secures it, and sends it to the Mac where it has... They used to have the T2 chips in the Mac, but those were just essentially like A10 processors. And now mm -hmm. all of that, the secure element, is built into the M1. So it goes straight to the oh. M1, and you can have multiple keyboards. Uh, you know, it, it works really, really well for Touch ID. Nice, nice. I, yeah, I was curious how that kind of... Uh, if, the, if the process was... If the setup process was similar, how that kind of worked to, to sort of uh, and you have first to, like, authenticate. Touch you have to click the power button on the back twice when you're setting it up to prove that you actually have the Mac in front of you. And you're not trying to do this on the down low on anybody. Oh, so they've, nice. Yeah, it's it's well thought out. And they've been doing they've been doing authentication on the Mac through the iPhone and the Apple Watch for a few years now. So that part of it is all locked down. Cool. So now, one of the things that I heard you talk about a little bit on MacBreak Weekly, and I'd love to hear you talk more about this, um, because this machine, you know, some people are going... There's colors. It's not as powerful as some of uh, the, you know, the more powerful options that are available. Um, who exactly is this for? That kind of conversation. And there's suggestions that it would be good for education, but also good as like a, a family computer that you know everybody can use. And one of the things that you talked about was the. Um, camera in this and Apple talked a lot about the camera that's in this. So what are your what's your thoughts because you've been you've been um, historically pretty critical of the cameras that are built into Macs because they do on the whole not do a great job of, of capturing video. but Apple very much pushed this as a camera that could capture good video. and so I'm curious your thoughts on the camera that's in this one. Yeah so um, it's interesting because they made the lids so thin on the MacBooks that you and cameras want depth. Cameras want Z and X. The more like that's why lenses on on traditional cameras are so deep. It's because they want all that for the glass, and the lids just didn't provide for that. So we've been getting these 720p as in potato cameras on them for a long time. Uh, and M1 has a really good image signal processor. It's the same image signal processor that's in the iPhone 12. It's the same generation Apple Silicon. But there's only so much. Like you can only it'll enhance the 
really well, but there's very little to enhance. And so now we're getting a 1080p camera, which is sort of the opposite problem. The previous IMAX had a 1080p camera, but the A10, you know, it's like a four generations previous image signal processor. So it couldn't do all of the, the like the smart HDR features and the tone mapping and all of those things anywhere nearly as well. So we finally have the best of most worlds here. And I know some <laughs> people would like to go to 4K. I only say most because like, you know, it's still 1080p, but if you had up to and including like a, a YouTube tea spilling channel or reaction channel, you could do that entirely on this Mac. There are people pulling millions of views on YouTube with setups that are no better than this and just more complicated than this. This puts it all in like a nice little package that to your previous point, um, it's core for core. It's one of the most powerful computers out there. It just doesn't have higher level RAM options or higher level SSD options. If you need 32 or 64 gigabytes of RAM or four or eight terabytes of SSD, you can't get that internally and you can't get it for RAM at all. But you know, if you're happy with 60, a maximum of 16, maximum of two terabytes, this is so thin and it looks so, I didn't want to believe it because I'm a big black bezel fanatic. Um, but mm -hmm. the, the off-white bezels here make the whole thing seem almost ethereal. Like it's not translucent like a plastic Mac, like the original iMac, but it, it's, it really does blend away into your walls and it makes it any place that you're, you know, your spouse, your partner, your, you know, would tell you, no, you are not putting technology there. This is a house. You, you can now slide it in there. And I don't think they'd notice. <laughs> um, how does the display compare to the iMac Pro and iMacs of, of your, as we said earlier, is this a, a better display? Are we working with mini LED at this point or uh, how, how does it stack up? No, mini LED is only on the uh, the 12.9 inch iPad Pro for now. Uh, unfortunately, and I say unfortunately just because it's really, really good. This is still an, a traditional LED display. It just means it has a uniform backlight behind it. But Apple's always been really, really good about sourcing high quality panels, you know, from LG and Samsung and everybody like that. But their display team really goes above and beyond. They do all the other work themselves. Uh, and iMacs have had, it's been hard to find, you know, like for snobby designer type people, it's been really hard to find a a panel as good as the iMac for the even the same price as an iMac. And here you get like the computer thrown in on it and it's bigger now. It used to be 21.5 inches and now it's just a tad shy of 24 inches. But it is, again, one of the best panels you can get. Just And part of that is that they calibrate every single one of them at the factory. So mm. all of that technology is fine. But if it's, if it's all color higgledy-piggledy, it doesn't really help anybody. So this is, again, just one of the best panels. Uh, any last thoughts on the iMac before we move on to the iPad Pro? Only that all the entry-level Apple M1 computers are making me so hungry for the higher-end versions, like yes. the 15-inch MacBook Pro and the 32-inch iMac. I mean, I want, I just want them now, Micah. Yes. Please. Okay, moving on to the iPad Pro. Uh, you Folks are able to pre-order those and have them uh, arrive tomorrow. So some people will be getting their iPad Pro for the first uh, time tomorrow. Others will go to the store to purchase one. Uh, regardless, it's going to be out tomorrow, and that means that reviews for the iPad Pro are out. And Renee, you uh, put together a review of the iPad Pro. I know folks are super pumped um, about this new model. The, the last change, the last step up was not huge. And this one seems to be kind of uh, really drawing in folks. So let's focus on the 12.9 the inch iPad Pro first. And if there's anything to say about the smaller one, we can talk about that too. But uh, do you have one? What do you think of it? And is the screen as amazing as Apple seemed to tout on stage at its recent press event? I oh my it. God, it's there. there <gasps> wow. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's hard to describe. Like people are used to seeing iPhones with OLED displays and those look really, really good. But the problem you get with OLED as you get to bigger displays are things like, like OLED is so good for, uh, contrast ratio and high dynamic range, brightness levels, those things. But it, requ it requires so much mitigation. Like it's not a good technology. It's so many challenges to overcome. And Samsung and Apple are so good at that. And it works on phone size displays. But as you get bigger, those negative elements get more obnoxious, like off axis color shifting. It'll actually look more blue or more red when you start turning it sideways. And on a phone, that doesn't happen a lot. But if everyone's crowded around your iPad, it's more wicked obvious. And the same for like uniform brightness on an 
on a small display, you don't notice that. But when you're getting to a bigger display and you're trying to fire a lot, like you're watching an episode of Bad Batch and you're and they're in the snow and you're seeing just a bunch of white and it looks like it's all modeled, like that's just not a good thing. So Apple's using mini LED, which is a new technology that tries to make LED more like OLED, but without some of those bad points. So it uses just 10,000 tiny little LEDs in 2,500 local dimming zones. And that just means there's not one giant backlight anymore, but 2,500 little little backlights uh, that make sure that the, the blacks, the shadows stay inky, dark, black, shadowy, even when you get really high levels, like 1,600 nits of brightness. So it gives you a a close to OLED, it's a million to one, not two million to one, like the iPhone, but you get a really, really close to that experience uh, on a big screen. And it's one of the best displays I've ever seen anywhere. And I am a real display nerd. <laughs> yeah. And what's wild to me is that there are more individual dimming zones in the iPad Pro's new display than there are in the Pro Display XDR, uh, which yes. just kind of blows my mind. Um, this mini LED Well, that's technology. LED, not mini LED. That, that didn't bring the mini. Now we got the mini to go with it. Mm -hmm. Got it. That makes sense. So uh, with this, you, you've got the, this brand new screen. And now the question becomes, um, what are, what, like, what have been some of the places where you've most noticed it? You you mentioned sort of in in areas where where white uh, would be kind of modeled on uh, OLED, which interestingly is something that I had experienced in the past. Um, where I thought there was something wrong with my display, yeah. and it just ended up being the nature of OLED. Um, but with this new iPad Pro, of course you're going to see it in in movies. But I'm curious, is the experience different depending on what you're doing. So, uh, f for example, the um, upped refresh rates that, that Apple has uh, introduced in the past, what is that, ProMotion, those would only yes. come out in certain situations, right? Is the same thing at play here with this new display? Is it, Or is it kind of like an always-on, always, always viewable experience? No, one of the challenges with high frame rate on devices like this is that they're super power hungry. So you can just go to 120 hertz, but you'll consume a lot more battery. So what Apple wants is not high frame rate, but adaptive frame rate. So they'll ramp up to 120 hertz for things like scrolling so it looks really smooth or when you use the Apple Pencil on it. But then they'll ramp down to like you know, 60 hertz for your for just watching normal video or 48 hertz if you're going to watch a movie in like 24 frames per second, which I keep saying is the is the way that nature and Hollywood intended us to watch. <laughs> and the nice thing about 120 hertz is it's so easily divisible. So you can go to and then it'll even go lower, it'll go down to 24 hertz on the current iPads. It'll go down to like one hertz on the Apple Watch just so that it can serve battery when all you're doing is looking at a static screen or a photo or something like that. So the advantage is now you can watch on this iPad, if you're into consumption, you can watch all those movies in Dolby Vision HDR at 24 frames per second, which is pretty much the best viewing experience. Like that's what you'd get in a movie theater with a Dolby Vision system there. Right. Yeah, that's, that's what's pretty incredible about this. So then given that, um, where do you think this iPad Pro fits in, in sort of the lineup? Is this a machine that you see as a way for folks to kind of have um, the ultimate consumption device where they can watch these movies or uh, view these photos or, or, you know, any number of, of consumption options? Or is this a machine that you could see? I mean, have you tried doing any video editing on it, for example, or uh, picture, really in-depth picture photo editing on it? What's uh, What are some of the ways you kind of tried to tax the the system and, and did it hold up in comparison to other uh, machines that you use? Yeah, and I'll just preface it by saying that I, I tried to torture test both the 11-inch and 12.9-inch because in my head, the 11-inch has a, th a smaller thermal envelope and should tap out and lower frequency faster, but I couldn't. Like I was doing 25 minute video renders and they were both finishing at the same time. Um, wow. I do think the 11 inch is more of a consumption device. There's no mini LED on that one. I think that's just because of the cost. It adds about a hundred bucks to the price tag and Apple didn't want to go to 899 as a starting price tag on the, on the iPad Pro lineup. So I think it had to just go without this year at least. But for anyone who just wants that ultimate 
the ultimate iPad, as in like the one Steve Jobs brought out, the one that is clearly tablet first and you can do some typing on it, but you want that iPad experience, you want that consumption experience, or you just like you have a Mac to do a lot of work on and you want something to like take with you on the sofa or on trips, those sorts of things. I think the 11 inch is great. The 12.9 inch just gives you such a bigger canvas. So to your point, uh, I've done a bunch of photo editing and video editing on it. And the ability to do that on a bigger screen is great, but also to be able to do that in HDR. And I know like upcoming versions of Luma, Luma Fusion, Luma Touch, sorry, are going to be able to do multicam like we do in Final Cut Pro now. It just It's like looking at a tiny Pro Display XDR. You're doing perfectly color accurate, high dynamic range work. Or you're doing full P3, but but like with really good brightness levels, photo editing, so you're exactly sure what you're doing. For anyone who works with any sort of imaging, it just takes pro to a whole new level because you know it is exactly what you're looking at. And that's always been the biggest challenge for people doing that kind of work. Nice. All right, Renee, we are going to take a quick break, but we'll be back with more from you uh, after this. Yes, Micah, more on Apple in a moment. But first, let's take a break. Thank the sponsor of this episode. And that is none other than Manscaped, our go-to for men's below-the-waist grooming products. And by the way, Manscaped has a brand new product I want to tell you about, introducing the Ultra Smooth Package. It's a specialized groin shaving kit. It's going to help you buff, protect, and smooth even your most sensitive areas with their new crop shaver, crop exfoliator, and crop gel. So it's like a, a whole collection of awesome. And Manscaped has a solid discount uh, just for you. You're going to actually get 20% off as well as free shipping when you go to manscaped.com slash twit. That's 20% off as well as free shipping. Not a bad deal. Uh so you've got the, obviously, you know, we've talked about this on, on uh, the network many times. Manscaped are legends when it comes to uh, introducing down there hair trimmers. We'll put down there in, in air quotes, uh, <laughs> electric hair trimmers to that. Uh, we now have a, the like a traditional razor and set to get you trimmed front to back. And, you know, obviously you need a solid razor if you want a close shave. You don't want any speed bumps. You don't want any ingrown hairs to cause you any trouble, no accidental cuts. Those are the worst. How do you even begin on some of the hardest to reach places? Well, the Manscaped Ultra Smooth Package is a three-step kit to make your package the perfect package. So uh, it starts with the Crop Exfoliator. This is infused with ingredients that soothe, clear, and help the skin on and around your groin feeling refreshed. The, uh, the crop exfoliator can help uh, reduce the risk of, you know, those pesky ingrown hairs uh, in all of those places. Uh, secondly, there's the crop gel. And this is where you can see where you're shaving with a, a unique clear shaving gel that's just ma made just right for down there with four essential oils. It's kind of like a spa treatment every time you shave. And then finally, step three, uh, this is where you shave, right? It's time to shave. The crop shaver was actually designed for shaving the groin area with confidence. So you get three precision blades, uh, including extra wide lubricating strips and a pivoting head for the ultimate groin grooming experience. The Crop Shaver, it's not your average everyday razor. It's smaller, it's thicker, it has a micro comb bar uh, that allows for the best shave possible from any angle. And the angle is the important part. Sometimes it's strange angles. This is gonna do it. All three of these vegan, cruelty-free, and sulfate-free products are included, so you know you're in good hands there as well. It's time to get up close. It's time to get personal with the best tools for the job, and that's the Ultra Smooth Package from Manscaped. Check it out for yourself. Get 20% off, like I said, and free shipping. All you have to do is go to manscaped.com slash twit. That's 20% off plus free shipping when you go to manscaped.com slash twit. And smooth it out, fellas. With Manscaped, your bod is going to thank you. And we thank Manscaped for their support <laughs> of Tech News Weekly. Thank now you, Manscaped. Back to the Apple. So Back to the, the Apple other... News. 
<laughs> the other thing that Apple um, announced and said would be out sometime in mid-May, now we know uh, that it is uh, going to be available tomorrow, is the new Apple TV. And there's not a whole lot going on here, but Renee, I was hoping uh, you could talk about what is new in the new Apple TV and then your experience with this device. Ah, the new remote! Now, there's a couple of things new with the box. The box has got an update uh, in terms of performance. So it went from an, A an A10X to an A12 processor. And that just means thanks to all the new silicon in there, including Apple's video accelerators, it can handle not just 4K HDR, but it can handle 4K HDR 60 frames per second. So it's like we were talking about with the iPad before. If you do like it's sort of that look from the Hobbit movie when it was in, if you went to see it at one of the cinemas that could support it, where it's just much higher frame rates. Uh, it, it makes things look smoother. Some people don't like it, so you can still step back to uh, to 4K HDR 30 if you want to, but especially for sports and uh, you know some live events, games, those sorts of things, people really appreciate the higher frame rates. Absolutely. That's, you know, that was kind of, um, how does... Can you explain the difference between the the Apple TV 4K that's out that, or that's yeah that has been available for some time and this one? I know that you know it's higher frame rates, but what exactly uh, does that mean and um, what what exactly does that add to to the experience uh, in more precise terms? I guess because it, it's easy. It's you know a lot of people read okay, it's got higher frame rates, but what does that provide people uh, when they watch something on their TV versus what's available now? So the only way I can really describe it is that soap opera effect that we all hate and we all turn off when we go to our parents' place. It's like that, but done properly. So it's not that the motion is being smoothed. It's actually recording more motion. So the motion blur will look different. If your brain has been programmed by generations of TV, it, it might look a little too smooth at first. But I always tell people, like, give it a week. And then you also get the bonus of the technologies to support the higher bit rates, and that's HDMI 2.1, Wi-Fi 6. Uh, and to, to your uh, proclivities, Micah, you also get Thread now on the Apple TV, so you can <laughs> control all your HomeKit stuff over Thread. Yes, uh, HomeKit over Thread. That's a big, uh, big update. The This is Apple's second device to feature a Thread radio right after the HomePod Mini. Um, so people will be able to have these Thread radios in their home. And uh, as is Thread's hope, this is kind of a thing that just happens in the background. It's not something that uh, individual users really have to worry about. And in fact, um, once my HomePod Mini was connected to my Wi-Fi network and I added some Thread devices to my HomeKit setup, Thread, the Thread Radio just automatically started working and connecting all of those devices together and uh, just ridiculously, significantly improving the responsiveness of all those devices. Uh, you can learn more about Thread. Uh, a quick plug here, uh, twit.tv slash stt smart tech today. We talked to um, Jonathan Huey, who is the uh, VP of technology for the Thread group, and uh, we talked all about that. But um, the biggest change, of course, or the the one that you know most people are are really pumped about and or are hopeful about is that remote you were showing us earlier. Yeah. Um, is it the improvement that uh, we hoped for? It does does it feel different in the hand? Is it less uh, finicky with the adjustments? What do you think of the new Siri remote? Yeah, it's it's back to the unibody aluminum design, which the second generation remote had, the one that came with the 720p Apple TV back in 2010. But it's it's escalated since then, so it's it's heavier. It's notably heavier and thicker. The Siri button is moved to the side. The um, the menu button has become a back button with a little back on it. And you've got a mute button now as well because Apple's doing a lot more integration with cable companies. And so they're they're becoming the set-top box. They wanted to provide that functionality. If you're used to the Apple remote you have now, it will take like a couple hours or a day to get. So you're, you're not like you're just muscle memory muting instead of pausing or pausing instead of serying, doing all those sorts of things. I like it. It improves several things. Like the buttons are really clicky. But for me, the most important thing is... It doesn't just have a touchpad. It has a jog wheel as well. So you can you can swipe across the middle, but you can click on the corners uh, and you can even spin like an old fashioned iPad, uh, sorry, an iPod to go backwards and forwards across the timeline. But so many apps on the Apple TV, 
uh, especially like big video company apps were just the worst apps. Like they didn't even bother making those template HTML kit apps. They just ported over their OpenGL app from a smart TV and you would try to get to a tab and you'd go three tabs and try to go back and go four tabs the wrong way. And it was, it was so maddening. And this lets you just go like one by one when you want to. It can't stop those apps, those apps from reloading constantly, which is my other, you know, nightmare scenario. I'm about to press on something and it reloads, but it does fix mm -hmm. the navigation. Uh, I still have a problem with the back button because apps implement it so differently. Like in TV Plus, you press the back button and you get a menu pop up saying like more episodes. But in others, you'll just like leave the the video yes, or like that's... it'll dismiss the overlay in YouTube. But in Amazon, it won't dismiss the overlay. It'll throw you out of the video. So I hate that inconsistency, but at least the button's better named, I guess. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you on that. That's one of the because everything else I could figure out, but that one where depending on the app, what what that button does might be different. Um, and then it's like you know, circa just having 2007 Android back button, it gives me flashbacks. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, anything else about the Apple TV before we move on to the last bit of news? Just that you know. It, you can get the TV app on so many smart TVs and so many other devices now that a lot of people wonder about like the Apple TV, what it's worth. But I still think like Apple does a really good job with privacy, privacy, security and accessibility. And they have features on there like Apple Arcade, like Fitness Plus. So I think, you know, if if you don't, if you're not all in the Apple ecosystem, it probably makes sense just to use your smart TV. But if you have subscriptions, especially if you have like an Apple One subscription and you're all in on the ecosystem, like you can use your iPhone now to, to color balance the television set. So if, if you are living that sort of all in Apple life, then it's it's the best way to have all your Apple stuff and on your TV. There we go. All right. Well, speaking of accessibility, um, Apple made a big announcement uh, yesterday about some new software updates coming uh, to iOS and other places um, that will kind of uh, make a change, uh, will make a significant improvement in many ways uh, in terms of accessibility. Could could you sort of run down the list of, of some of these awesome new features that uh, you talked about? Yeah. Well, the first one that is just so mind-blowing, brain-busting to me, and that is they're bringing assistive touch to the Apple Watch. And that was like, how? Because assistive touch is meant for people who have difficulty with motor skills or, you know, they're, they're, they, they're uh, non-normative, like maybe they've lost a hand or they have minimal function. Uh, and how, how do you control an Apple Watch that way? And so what they're doing is using the accelerometer, the gyroscope, um, the... the um, Pulse, uh, I'm blanking on the name, but the pulse, basically the thing that reads your pulse on the Apple Watch and then using machine learning to figure out like if you clench your fist or pinch your fingers. So if the phone rings, for example, you can clench your fist to answer it. You can pinch your fingers to wow. move to different actions and you'll be able to navigate and control. Like all the nerds are immediately thinking about augmented reality uses for this, but just in terms of accessibility, um, like even if you if you don't have uh, constant accessibility needs, but like you, you just Peter McKinnon your hand and you need to be able to, to do something on your Apple Watch, it's so... It's it's so like next gen future forward, and I love that Apple like spends significant resources trying to keep pushing this stuff, or their accessibility team spends a lot of time working on these sorts of uh, interfaces. Wow, the difference between a fist clench and a finger pen pinch can be detected on the watch. For folks who are listening, we're showing a little video that shows the difference between them. So a double um, fist clench would answer the call and a single fist clench, it looks like lets you, or, or rather a finger pinch lets you switch between different options and then clenching will select that option. And then just depending on what you're doing, moving your wrist around kind of rocks a little pointer back and forth on the display. Yeah. Uh, they call it the motion pointer to let you see, to let you select different things. That is very future forward. That's, mm -hmm. This is really neat. Um, so what about eye tracking on iPad? Yeah, they're starting that on iPad. I, I'm guessing it'll eventually come everywhere, but they need to start it somewhere. And they're working with third parties so that you'll be able to get one of these third party eye tracking um, accessories. And then where you look around the screen, it'll move the cursor for you. And where you stare, it'll start doing actions like tapping on that area. So it was, again, it's meant for people with motor, uh, with motor challenges to be able to better control their devices in any way that's the best way for them to control them. 
And they're doing the same, something similar with hearing aids now because hearing aids are getting more advanced. And they're often including microphones as well so that people who have hearing aids don't have to use a separate device to do phone calls or Zoom meetings or uh, or FaceTime calls. They'll be able to support just the hearing aid to, for both uh, you know talk and hearing at the same time. And none of this stuff is slowing down. Like they're they're going down the line of sort of like the there's another feature they they debuted earlier where it'll describe an image to you. So it'll say you know there's a person standing next to a car, and they're developing that further. So for example, it might know that that's Jason standing next to his blue truck, and be able to give you more. Uh, like in-depth information about the picture over voice, like using voiceover. Uh, and then you'll be able to add your own using mark, markup. You'll be able to add your own annotations to it saying like, this is the day that Jason got that new truck. It's nowhere near as clean as it was that day. Never has been hey, since. Hey, no, just for your bit. All right. It's just, it's just as clean as Jason's truck. <laughs> you know, it. Uh, and then what about background sounds? What is this feature? Because this is interesting to me. This is um, Apple talks about uh, a feature that to help support neurodiversity. Uh, and I think that that is very fascinating as a neurodiverse individual. Um, this background sounds feature actually sounds really exciting. Yeah, I, I called it basically like a hug for your ears. Like, you know, when you give one of those strong hugs and those are often have a very big calming effect. This is sort of the same thing. By providing that that background sound, it can provide a level of stress reduction. Of It allows for focus, you know, concentration, all those things, because it takes out what can often be random distracting sounds and replaces them with... Um, What's the right word for it? Things that you're expecting. It's not that always the same. It's but if if you if you choose bright, uh, or you know, a random pattern, or you choose river noises or ocean noises, you know that's there, and you can have this now while you're studying or while you're traveling, and it'll even duck under calls or other audio like system messages coming in, so you can leave it on, and then you always have sort of that that safety blanket of audio playing while you're trying to do everything else. And it just, it reduces the amounts of abrupt changes in your environment, which can be so unsettling for people. Yeah. Um, I think that's a super, super cool feature. I'm looking forward to checking out as well. Um, and then the other thing that I uh, wanted to mention is some new changes to Memoji because everybody should feel like they can be represented in Memoji. Uh, what were the changes there? Or updates there. So this again, yeah. So they, they previously they added uh, hearing aids to Memoji, and now they're adding oxygen tubes, cochlear implants, and soft helmets to headwear. And the purpose of this is just so that you can see yourself in your emoji. They always want to make it more and more customizable, so they can be more and more like us. Like whether you want to believe that that's part of some digital AR avatar that's coming in the future to Apple's products, or just a way to express ourselves in the here and now in a way that looks like ourselves. It, it just they want everyone to be able to make the closest digital representation that they can. Gotcha. All righty. Well, Renee, I want to thank you so much for taking all this time uh, to, to tell us about all these new updates. There was a lot of stuff, and I'm really glad that you were able to hang around for two sessions here to talk with us. Um, <laughs> if folks want to check out your great work online and follow you, where do they go to do that? They can go to youtube.com slash Renee Ritchie, uh, and they can catch me every Tuesday on Twit on MacBreak Weekly. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you, Renee. We appreciate it. Thank you, Renee. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Micah. All righty. Up next is Jason's story of the week. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by, yes, it's Audible. Have you ever wanted to read a memoir and you just didn't have the time? Or maybe you found a title that you couldn't put down, but you kind of had to put down because you needed to fold the laundry. Now, you can do both because Audible is there for you. Yes, Audible makes it all possible. When you're driving, you're cooking, you're cleaning your house, or just relaxing, you can listen to amazing audio files with Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment all in one place. At Audible, you can find the largest selection of audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, languages, business, motivation, and more. 
You can get original entertainment from top celebrity creators and thousands of popular and binge-worthy podcasts. They are now offering their newest plan, which is called Audible Plus. Audible Plus gives you full access to their popular Plus catalog. Audible Plus is all about giving members a chance to listen to and discover new favorites and explore different formats, like the exclusive Words Plus Music series, or a podcast you never considered before, even theatrical performances. You can listen all you want to thousands and thousands of popular audiobooks, original entertainment, and podcasts, including ad-free versions of your favorite shows and exclusive series. They're all available to download or stream, so you can listen anywhere, anytime, on any device, and you will never lose your spot. To use your Audible membership, you'll need to download the Audible app. The Audible app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. Folks, I love Audible. I, I kind of consider it like a superpower because while you are doing the things that you would normally be doing, you can also be listening to audiobooks. And so I will often, if I'm you know doing, um, doing the dishes or it's time to do some laundry or I'm crocheting or knitting or something like that, along with doing those tasks, I can also pass the time listening to an audiobook. Uh, my partner recently went on a um, had, had to go on a long drive and uh, was worried about what uh, he was going to listen to why or what he was going to do while he was taking this long drive and I said you've got to do an audiobook you've got to do it I, I know you think it's not your thing but I promise you you're gonna it'll help you pass the time so I got him to check out um, the Harry Dresden uh, series of audiobooks called The Dresden Files. And um, he's hooked now, <laughs> which was a wonderful thing because <laughs> The Dresden Files is fantastic. And I enjoyed every single one of those uh, audiobooks and continue to as uh, new ones come out. And uh, yeah, it's always great to make a new Audible fan and just kind of introduce people to this idea of, of being able to consume content while you're doing other things. And it's not just a for me, mostly it's it's fantasy and fiction audiobooks, but there are also great titles uh, for learning new things or learning about a historical uh, situation or figure. It's really cool what Audible has to offer. Listening to Audible will make you feel inspired, connected, and it's available all in one app. Audible Plus is your playlist for life. So what are you waiting for? Delve into your next title on Audible with Audible Plus. New members can try Audible Plus for 30 days. Download the Audible app and get started with a free trial at audible.com slash TNW. Or we've got a short code for you. Text TNW to 500-500. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash TNW. Or text TNW to 500-500 to start your free trial today. Thanks so much to Audible for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. Jason Howell, take it away. All righty. We'll start the engines. Okay, so um, today is the final day of Google I.O., the digital edition uh, 2021. Last year, Google didn't have Google I.O. for a number of reasons, this year, they decided to do it all digital. So, you know, a couple of days ago, we had the, the keynote with Sundar Pichai and a host of other um, bigwigs at Google. And then, but it's a developer conference. And, you know, so a lot of the the stuff that's been happening in the last couple of days is very developer focused. But I thought since this is the end of Google I.O., maybe um, I'm sure you've you've got some uh, thoughts as far as, you know, maybe one or two things that, that stood out to you, Micah. Um, but I certainly have a few things that I've been thinking a lot about this week since the keynote. So I thought I would just kind of rattle through a few of the things that really um, stood out as highlights to me personally. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm sure to a certain degree, you can probably guess what a couple of them are. Uh, Android 12 beta one is now officially out on pixel devices. I have installed on my, um, on my pixel, which, um, what it brings is the beginnings of something called material U, and the idea with material U. So, so yes, this is the beta and it actually looks very similar to, um, you know, the previous version that I had on here, Android 11, um, because Material U is not fully baked into Android 12 
uh, beta one yet. It is partially. If I pull down and show kind of my notifications and the quick quick settings and everything, you start to see how things are are looking a lot bigger, more colorful, a little blockier. Like this slider for the for the uh, display brightness is huge. <laughs> Used to be this <laughs> tiny little dot on a tiny little line, and now it's a lot larger. Um, you can see now I've got some, you know, notifications and everything's really rounded and um, kind of pleasing. I can expand, which you could do before. It's just things are themed differently, which is, oh, Hank uh, just posted, Hank Laporte just posted a new video um, on TikTok. Uh, good to know. I'll check that out later. But <laughs> Material U is an extension of Material Design, which was first introduced, I think, like seven years ago. I'm just guessing on that. But really, it's taking this concept of material design, which was meant to kind of replicate kind of, um, kind of you know, uh, patterns and, and textures and stuff from the real world and put it into an inter um, interactive interface. And Material U is really all about customization of that to a larger degree. So a lot of what Google showed off are just these, you know, really... Um, I feel like very captivating uh, themes that are automatically, to my knowledge, created around a wallpaper. We've seen this in in phones before. Pixels doing it, um, you know, doing their own version of it. So you know, someone could say, "Oh, well, that's nothing new. I've seen that before." Um, but I think what's really interesting is that they're interconnecting this. Uh, again, based on my understanding of what they what they mentioned, they're interconnecting this with all of their other devices, not just smartphones. So if you have a Nest Hub hanging on the wall and you have a Chromecast with Google TV on your TV set and on your phone you've themed it a certain way, from my understanding, that means that the theme that you choose on your phone could in some ways trickle down to all of these other devices and really connect them to the overall theme that you've selected which I think is an interesting um, interesting idea. I want to see how it works in practice. Maybe I don't want my Nest Hub or maybe I don't want my Nest thermostat to look a certain way, you know, to, to mirror what's going on on my smartphone. But I think it's a really interesting way to kind of tie all of their devices together um, to be more of like an ecosystem play, did, which is, can, I think, largely what you? Google's... What's up? So, oh, yeah, go. Did you, say, did you say a Nest Hub hanging on your wall? Is that, how do you do that? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I meant a Nest thermostat. Oh, I thought, oh man, I was really, I was like, wait, there's a Nest Hub for the wall? I didn't know about that this. I want to get one. Yeah, no, that, I, I misspoke <laughs> and I apologize okay. about that. No, but, okay. but it would reach into the Nest Hub. So sure, if you want to, you want to paste a Nest Hub on your on your wall, go for <laughs> I it. I guess on a shelf would work. <laughs> that would be neat, though. Like I've gone to people's houses and they have an iPad like embedded in the wall yeah. as like a home control system. So that would be really yeah. nice. Or like a picture um, frame, but it's a Nest Hub yeah. built into it. Totally, totally. Um, there you go, Google. But yeah, over yeah, just go ahead. You can have that for free, Google. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they're already working on it. But I like the idea of kind of like syncing all of these things together, um, not just from a control standpoint, using my phone to to control the Nest thermostat, but having a little bit of a visual kind of tie together. I don't know. Does that sound at all appealing to you? I, th I think it's kind of neat. Entirely. Um, so I was really pumped to download um, the Android. It's 12, right? 12 beta yep. uh, as well onto this older Google Pixel device. And um, I was kind of bummed because I didn't hear the part about it, the material you not being ready yet and so or fully ready yet. And so I was kind of looking right. around like, wait, where do I set that up? I, I don't understand. Um, but the idea that all of those devices suddenly feel personal is really cool. The one thing that I'm a little eh about is that no matter what, no matter what um, sort of uh, automation slash smart home slash that whole space, Internet of Things space, no matter what company you're talking to, be it Google or Amazon or Apple, no matter which one you're looking at, I should say, they all have this very individual uh, approach to this stuff. And so yeah, they do. you suddenly, you know, you make the change on your phone and that updates everything in the house. But what about the other people in the house who also have Android devices who change their material? You do they not get to have you know personalized yeah. screens? So it does feel still very single person focused and single person minded. Um, mm -hmm. And 
in a household like mine where it's it's fine because the other person is not really interested in any of that Internet of Things stuff, that works. But it's still like even I would feel kind of bad about that sort of laying claim, so to speak, to all of this. And so right. I wish that uh, these companies would pay a little bit closer attention to being mindful of the fact that oftentimes it's not just one person in a house with these other devices. And so suddenly you're just spraying the walls with your specific color uh, and you yeah. know, the hubs and everything with your specific color is kind of uh, a bummer. But in terms of my own personal device, getting to have the wallpaper match with the um, icons and, and the, the, you know, the, the notifications and all that kind of stuff, I think Material U is super cool because I can't wait to change my background to a really pretty green and then have everything else kind of uh, match that, that theme and that color. That's going to look neat O. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I think that's a bit what you're talking about, you know, as far as multiple people and customization, that's a big challenge. Like how, how do you do that in a way that respects everybody uh, individually instead of just focuses on one person? Almost think like, you know, just taking the nest um, thermostat on the walls that as the example, if that has ultra wideband built into it and you're, you know, you've got your phone in your pocket and you approach it, does it right? You know, I, I don't think that it actually does this now, but would it at, in someday in the future recognize that it is you standing in front of the thing and that's, you know, how it changes it outside of that? Like, I don't know how, how Google could do that and uh, and uh, kind of respect all the different people in household, because I'll find myself in that position uh, when this rolls out uh, between my wife and I, you know, what what is what what is the customization that uh, takes precedent over the other one? And I guess we don't know the answer to that yet. It might not even work this way. This is my understanding of it. So I'll be curious to see how Google tackles that. Um, no, another thing that I thought was interesting was the uh, Wear OS slash Samsung slash Fitbit um, announcement because Wear OS has just been... <sighs> it's been super ho hum for quite a while now. Definitely fallen off the radar as far as wearables are concerned, and especially compared to the behemoth that is the Apple Watch. Uh, Samsung has done really well in wearables. Um, you know, not not Apple Watch well, but as far as you know, competitors are concerned with true smartwatches, I would consider Samsung smartwatches to be kind of second in that list. So mm -hmm. the fact that they're getting on board with Google, and then you've got the Google owning Fitbit thing, and Fitbit, you know, uh, also getting into the mix, and and the the um, activity based. Uh, kind of functionality that people love out of their Fitbit reaching into this. I mean, it's a really interesting partnership. Do I think that it's going to, you know, uh, like suddenly make it so that the Apple Watch is like a second to uh, whatever they come up with? No, I'm pretty certain that the Apple Watch is, is solid and uh, in a great place for a very long time. But if they can improve the... Um, the wearable landscape for Android users at all, which I think that this, I have pretty good confidence that this is going to at least improve things, it's not going to make it worse, um, then I'm all for it because it's been kind of sad to watch it all just kind of fizzle to where it has been. So um, Google Chrome uh, password alert I thought was kind of neat. This The idea here is, and I feel like this got, didn't get a whole lot of coverage, but the idea here is it's tapping into assistance duplex feature. And duplex is uh, something, it's actually a feature that I don't really use, but if you want to if you want to use your assistant to say wait in line uh, for a reservation or or you know different things like that it's it's very audio based so that you mm -hmm. don't have to stay online you can kind of have your assistant be your assistant and then let you know when it's time or make the reservation for you uh, really cool stuff well they're using duplex now or they're going to so that when you visit a website and it recognizes, and your assistant recognizes, uh, or Google, your your Google uh, password account recognizes that the password that you're using has been compromised in some way. Then it's going to give you the opportunity to use Duplex on Assistant to automatically change the password on that site for you. So you don't have to find where that's stored in the settings of this particular site. You don't have to choose what the password is. It's all done automatically. They choose a highly secure password. They automatically uh, make the change on the site for you using the duplex smarts. And then they store that password into your password manager. Um, and so it really lowers the bar on what we all need, which is better password health and, and, uh, 
Um, you know, often what's holding us back from that is that it's inconvenient to make these changes. This makes it a little more convenient. And I think that's neat. I think it's necessary. That's an incredibly important feature. Um, I, I love that. And with, you know, the number of people I know who use, uh, Google Chrome, it, that, that's going to make a big difference. So I'm glad that, uh, they're being smart about that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And then another thing that, that, uh, I just thought was kind of a neat show of technology. I know Leo didn't care for it too much. He talked about it yesterday on this week in Google, although Stacy Higginbotham was way into this as well was project Starline. And this was, uh, the it's, it's a large screen, uh, using light field technology where basically I could sit in front of this screen and have, on the other side, a person who I'm talking with who is in a completely different geographical location using this technology. And it's as if they are there because the um, light field technology is like glasses free 3D. And it's not just a video camera that's capturing them. What's interesting about this to me is that it's truly like a recreation of that person. Uh, they're using their um, their computer um, processing on both ends to capture the person, you know, whoever the person is on the opposite end and digitize them and then reproduce them on the other side. So you're looking into each other's eyes, even though you're not looking directly into the camera. Um, and, and because it's in a three dimensional, uh, presentation and, uh, perfectly scaled. So it's scaled in a way that you're, it's almost like you're sitting across the table from someone. Like it just like, it gives me kind of goosebumps to like, think about what that, what that experience is feels like when you're sitting in front of that and maybe you're seeing someone like I'm seeing my parents, even though I just saw them, but I'm, you know, during the pandemic, the opportunity to see my parents as if they were right there, that just feels science fiction to me. And I love the idea of it. And the fact that Google's doing it, it's, it's one of the things I love about Google. They like to play around with things like that. Whether you actually see it ever is another story, <laughs> but I think it's really neat that they're thinking about these things and creating them. And I'm sure at some point we'll see it in some fashion, maybe not like this, maybe in a different way, but, uh, neat nonetheless. Very cool. Yeah. I, uh, I would, I would love to have been one of the people in the room to actually see it, you know, in yeah. use. That'd be super neat. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm curious to know, um, if there's anything that really stood out to you about IO. So here's the deal. Um, as of this morning, there was a thing that I was quite pumped about. I thought it was a really cool thing, um, a, a democratizing tool. I've talked a lot on different podcasts about how um, we spend our lives piloting these ambulatory flesh bags we call bodies. And a lot of times we don't know a whole lot about them. And there are, of course, specialists, doctors uh, who know more about them and who, um, you know, we go to to learn more about them. But it's kind of wild to me that even though we have to spend all of this time with our bodies, that it's sort of um, it's sort of like the I don't know, a, a printer cartridge or a, a modern car where it's kind of hard for you to fix it yourself. It's something that you have to go in and see somebody yeah. that you have fixed and you don't necessarily right. know what all of the parts are and what they all mean. And so democratization of, of health, I think is a really cool thing. And I think it's an important thing where people have more access to information in a way that's safe and that is accurate. And, uh, especially given in the United States, at least, the ridiculous um, imbalance of, of health care costs and uh, health, health insurance and all of that kind of stuff. So with that in mind, I was really pumped about this um, dermatology diagnostic tool that Apple or the Apple that Google announced um, on stage at uh, Google I.O. And essentially what it would do is it would let you take photos of, say, a spot or a rash or something like that on your body, and then you could upload it to this thing. It would use AI, and then it would determine, um, based on you know AI models, what uh, this might be, which would give you more information. And given the fact that doctors are, even, even if you are able to go to a doctor, so overworked, so um, overbooked, um, 
and in many cases are are so overbooked to the point that you know by the end of the day they're playing catch up every single day you have to be an advocate for yourself in those situations and oftentimes you are uh you end up being responsible for doing some of the research on your own to bring to the doctor because mm-hmm. they just don't have enough time in a day to do that you know all of that research so i love this as an idea for a tool that would be um a diagnostic tool to help you and your doctor figure out a solution for you if it was something that needed to be solved. But here's the thing. Um, This morning, Vice published a report um, about this new um, dermatology tool. And it is a tool that came out of a May 2020 study that Google researchers uh, published in the journal Nature Medicine where they demonstrated the efficacy of using deep learning to recognize skin conditions. Now, in order to do this and to show the efficacy, they trained it on a data set of a little under 65,000 images of uh, a little over 12,000 patients, but only 3.5% of those came from patients with brown and dark brown or black skin, uh, which means that a huge percentage of the database is white people and uh, mm-hmm. people with you know lighter skin, uh, which means that it's not going to be as accurate for people with darker skin. And given the um, <laughs> given the, the the chart of uh, who does and does not have health insurance, who does and does not fall into certain financial brackets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this was incredibly disappointing to me. I was very excited about this tool. I, I, you know, championed the democratization of of um, information in general, and in particular, uh, health and and related fields. And so, to learn that a company that continues to um, to show its problem with diversity <laughs> and to show its lack of diversity and uh, thinking about diversity um, was really a letdown for me, especially because I was also excited about the other announcement that uh, Google made about um, its computational engine getting better at uh, processing photos of people with darker skin, um, where a lot of my white colleagues were kind of you know, uh, sort of saying, okay, you're now, now you're doing this, but let's talk about the, the AI, um, ethics stuff that's going on and these other concerns of, of, um, of diversity that, uh, people have brought up. And I thought, you know, even though that stuff is going on, I still want to celebrate, um, this being brought to the forefront and to make people think about, about it and to know, uh, that there, that, for the history of photography, it has been made for the white gaze and for white skin and mm-hmm. gaze, G-A-Z-E. Um, right. And so I, you know, was pumped about that. And then I was pumped about this. So then to learn that it was, it's using a data set that is um, it's 3.5% is all uh, for, for those uh, involved so in this data set. It's, That's it's so low. disappointingly low. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. I, you know, and it's, and it's a uh, further indication of something that is very, I feel is very, um, very apparent about Google is just their extreme kind of like siloing that happens on the inside. They, they are working on, you know, like the, the, the announcement that they made about the more equitable camera technology, that is something to be celebrated. At least they're, at least they're announcing that they are pay, they are paying attention to it. Um, you know, you could argue that you know this should have been paid attention to a whole lot sooner than now. At least there's some some action going on there. But like, how does that effort sync up with? you know, this other effort. And, you know, this is just one example of many where these, these efforts never are really kind of, uh, syncing up together and you end up with this really mixed kind of confused, um, message at the end of it. And, uh, it's like one step forward, you know, one and a half, two steps forward back or two steps backwards. Um, so it, it takes kind of the good, 
the good message and uh, you can't quite celebrate it as much because you're just not quite there. That's that's so disappointingly low, uh, three and a half percent. Yep. But um, I'm uh, yeah, I wasn't I was not even aware of this Vice article, so I'm gonna have to read through that. <laughs> yeah, neither um, was but, I. But at until... the same time. Yeah, at the same time, I'm absolutely not surprised at all. Like, I'm not surprised that that Google that that uh, study like this would happen with Google. It's just this is this is just one of those things that that gets overlooked time and time and time again. And even if the intentions, even if there's the best intentions there, how, if this is the case, how does it get uh, overlooked? I don't even know. I don't know how right. it happens. It's disappointing. Sigh. Well. Yeah. That's that, but um, that's that. Why don't we let Why don't we let folks know uh, when they can check out the show? All right. Well, <laughs> you can always check out this show every Thursday. This is when we record this show every Thursday morning, afternoon ish, and it publishes a little bit later in the day. So, Tech News Weekly. Just go to twit.tv slash tnw, and you can find the show. Uh, you can subscribe audio, video formats. Jump out to YouTube. Subscribe there. Uh, that's what you need to know. Twit.tv slash tnw. Oh, and if you want all of our shows ad-free, then you definitely have to check out our very cool Club Twit. For seven bucks a month, you're going to get every Twit show with no ads, plus an exclusive Twit Plus bonus feed with extra content, including behind the scenes, before the scenes, after the scenes, extras, all sorts of good stuff there. And of course, uh, you'll gain access to what is quickly becoming the most popular perk of the package, uh, the members-only Discord server, where you uh, can join us and hang out and chat um, and have lots of conversations with other uh, Club Twit members and uh, us hosts as well. So for seven bucks a month, just head to twit.tv slash club twit to sign up. And we appreciate you for doing so. Your support means the world to us. And one of the first um, results of the Club Twit uh, kickoff is that tomorrow, um, Leo Laporte will be doing a special episode. Uh, you can check it out on the Twit news feed. Uh, where he'll be talking with the author of The Martian. And uh, that was made possible by Club Twit. So thank you, Club Twit members. Um, if you want to follow me on social media or tweet at me or any of those things, you can follow me at Micah Sargent on pretty much all the social media sites. Uh, and check out Smart Tech Today later today, iOS Today, tomorrow. Uh, all great shows here on the Twit Network. What about you, Jason? Um, yeah. So, uh, let's see here. Patrick Delahanty is just, uh, putting in a quick correction here. Twit events feed, not Twit news. So look Oops. for the Twit events feed and you'll find it. The, that's the interview, uh, with Andy Weir. Uh, everybody's looking forward to that. It's going to be a cool interview. Uh, I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Um, you know, all about Android is one of my other prime, uh, shows on the network. I happen to also be a guest on this week in tech this upcoming Sunday, Guarantee you we're going to be talking a lot about Google I.O., uh, but uh, so you can look forward to that as well. Uh, big thanks to John Ashley, to Burke, to Patrick uh, for giving us uh, the correction and to everyone who helps us do this show each and every week. And big thanks to you for watching and listening each time we have a new episode. We appreciate you. And we'll see you next time on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, hands-on photography here on Twit TV. Each and every week, Thursday that is, I like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop. It's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera. It can be the simplest of things like leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder. All of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up. So subscribe to the show today. That's twit.tv slash hop. And I look forward to talking to you soon.